Goedenavond allemaal. Um, welkom in de Bali. Een avond over uh, prostitutie. En met toestemming van Melissa Farley begin ik heel kort in het Nederlands. Uh, om daarna uiteraard Engels te gaan praten. Uh, want anders snapt de hoofdgast van de avond niet waar het over gaat. Um, ik wil in het Nederlands beginnen heel even om te adresseren wat er eigenlijk in aanloop na deze avond al gebeurde. En ik vind dat inmiddels zelf kenmerkend voor het... Uh, Prostitutiedebat. Mijn naam is Meerte Hilkens. Ik ben van origine journalist en werd later heel kort het mislukte falikant Kamerlid. Uh, maar ik was onder andere woordvoerder op dit dossier. En ik uh, bestond het om met een collega van de ChristenUnie naar Zweden te reizen voor een documentaire over het Zweedse prostitutiemodel. En de reden waarom ik dat deed was heel eenvoudig. Heel veel voorgangers van mij in de Tweede Kamer hadden vrij uitgesproken meningen over het Zweedse model. Daar is de man of vrouw die seks koopt strafbaar. Nooit de man of vrouw die zijn lichaam of haar lichaam verkoopt. Uh, maar er was heel veel opinie over in het parlement. Maar er was nog nooit iemand dus naar Zweden gevlogen om te kijken hoe het nou eigenlijk kwam. Dat een land waar wij in heel veel opzichten op lijken... zo'n fundamenteel andere keus had gemaakt eigenlijk in precies dezelfde periode als wij. Want wij besloten voor legalisering te kiezen. Um, nou, laat ik zeggen dat als je daar naïef aan begint, dat je vrij snel uit een vrij bruut droom ontwaakt. Want wat er dan gebeurt is zeer merkwaardig. Een soort totale massahysterie. Binnen een etmaal was vastgesteld dat ik hoerenlopen strafbaar wilde stellen. Nou, vanavond gaan we luisteren naar een gast, Melissa Farley uit Amerika, die... Um, op grond van jarenlang onderzoek, ze publiceerde 33 uh, peer-reviewed artikelen over het thema seksueel geweld en prostitutie en kwam als gevolg tot de, de conclusie dat ze legalisering niet kan en niet wil omarmen als um, uh, model waarbinnen we dit moeten gaan reguleren. En alleen al het feit dat zij hier vanavond is, liet de emoties hoog oplopen. En daar wil ik één ding over zeggen. De veronderstelling was bij sommigen in uh, het debat, onder andere op sociale media, dat de Bali geen tegenspraak heeft georganiseerd vanavond. Alleen Melissa Farley krijgt het woord en ik ben er met jullie om kritische vragen te stellen. Dan is dat vast duidelijk. Daartoe is alle ruimte en gelegenheid. Um, de veronderstelling was dat doet de balie omdat ze sowieso een wat ambivalente houding heeft tegenover sekswerk en ons legaliseringsmodel. Um, die mensen wil ik vragen om gewoon eens door de agenda van de afgelopen jaren te bladeren en dan zul je vanzelf ontdekken dat er ook heel veel avonden waren waarin sekswerkers, eigenaren van seksclubs hier spraken zonder dat er tegenspraak bij hen georganiseerd werd. Voor mij, en ik denk ook voor de balie, is het vooral een denkexercitie ingegeven door het feit, want dat staat buiten kijf, dat we sinds de legalisering in 2000 heel veel wijzer zijn geworden over de omstandigheden waaronder sommige vrouwen en mannen werken. En het aantal slachtoffers van bijvoorbeeld zoiets als mensenhandel. Corine Detmeijer, de nationaal rapporteur, heeft ons vrij recent geleerd na zorgvuldig onderzoek dat het aantal slachtoffers van mensenhandel in de prostitutie na alle waarschijnlijkheid vijf keer hoger ligt dan tot nu toe verondersteld. Het is dus een denkexercitie en ik hoop dat we die met elkaar in kalmte en rust en elke kritische nood die u daarbij nodig acht... Uh, gaan meemaken met, en nu ga ik Engels praten, Melissa Farley, all the way from San Francisco. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, Melissa Farley is, I'm going to do this with a little paper because I want to be complete, anti-prostitution and anti-pornography activist, feminist, researcher, a clinical psychologist for about 40 years already. And you have been studying the effects of prostitution, trafficking, and sexual violence for, I think, about 20 years now. Uh, you're the founder and director of prostitution research and education in San Francisco. And we are very happy to have you here. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting to listen to you. Welcome, Melissa Farley. Thank you, Myrta. And thank you to the director of De Baile, Yuri Arbrecht. Thank you for your willingness to make a forum available that I hope will expand our discussion about prostitution. 
For the past 20 years, I've worked with the San Francisco nonprofit Prostitution Research and Education. Our goal is to understand prostitution from the perspective of those in it and to reflect the voices of survivors of prostitution. We do our best to educate those in public health and social sciences, the public and policymakers, about prostitution and trafficking. Before I knew anything about prostitution, I was a psychologist with a practice where, like many others, I saw that so many of women's mental health problems resulted from men's violence and abuse. One day someone called me up and asked if I would write a letter of protest because a San Francisco commission to study prostitution was attempting to silence a survivor who wanted to speak about prostitution. She was too negative, this political commission said. She talked about things like getting kicked in the head by her pimp and getting raped by men who bought her. I wrote the letter she and I met, and since the government commission refused to accept her testimony, she and I decided to do our own research. We interviewed 130 women prostituting in San Francisco and got that study published. Then other NGOs said that they wanted to do similar studies, so we published a second paper about prostitution in five countries. Ten years later, a study of prostitution in nine countries was published, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. Pro Make sure I can move this. Um, can anyone help me with this uh, device? Oh, it happened. Thank you. <laughs> Prostitution is the business of sexual exploitation, as was the case with the, my friend in San Francisco. Survivor testimony about the sex trade functions as a devastating strike against pimps, their political allies, and those who reap profits from prostitution. Some pimps, some sex buyers, and some governments have made the decision that it's reasonable to expect certain women to permit 10 men a day to sexually exploit or assault them in order to survive. These women most often are poor and most often are ethnically or racially marginalized. A Canadian prostitution tourist, um, uh, is that on? Okay, great. A Canadian prostitution tourist said, uh, talking about prostitution in Thailand, these girls got to eat, don't they? I'm putting bread on their plate. I'm making a contribution they'd starve to death unless they hoard. This self-congratulatory Darwinism avoids the question, do women have the right to live without the sexual harassment or sexual exploitation of prostitution? Or is that only reserved for those of us who have race or class privilege? You get what you pay for without the no a sex buyer explained. Non-prostituting women have the right to say no. We have legal protection from sexual harassment and sexual exploitation, but tolerating sexual abuse is the job description for prostitution. The existence of prostitution anywhere is society's betrayal of women and its betrayal of those who are vulnerable and marginalized because of inequality. Survivors of prostitution explain, prostitution is like domestic violence taken to the extreme. A woman in a Nevada legal brothel explained, it's like you sign a contract to be raped. 
His payment, however, does not erase what we know about sexual violence, verbal sadism, domestic violence, and rape. Whether or not it's legal, prostitution is extremely harmful for women. Women in prostitution have the highest rates of rape and homicide against them of any group of women ever studied. They're regularly physically assaulted and verbally abused, as anyone knows who lives near a prostitution zone. It doesn't matter if they're prostituting on the street, massage parlors, strip clubs, brothels, or hotels. Today, prostituted women are advertised and trafficked by cell phone. We've interviewed more than 700 men who buy sex in five countries, and it's been an educational experience. One man described prostitution as renting an organ for 10 minutes. Prostitution is indeed the renting out of a woman's mouth, vagina, and anus, as the sex buyer put it, renting an organ for 10 minutes. Now, the Me Too groundswell of women's voices challenging everyday sexual predation by men like Donald Trump, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Woody Allen, this is incredible consciousness raising and courageous activism. But does this huge basket of women's voices include prostituted women? Is their Me Too welcomed? Sex trade survivors' voices are essential to a discussion of sexual harassment, rape, and male supremacy. Evelina Giobi, the founder of Whisper in the US, uh, one of the first survivor organizations in the world, I think, she wrote, Prostitution is not like anything else. Rather, everything else is like prostitution because it's the model for women's condition. Prostitution sets the parameters for what you can do to a woman. Sexual harassment is what prostitution is. If you remove the sexual harassment, there's no prostitution. If you remove unwanted sex acts, there's no prostitution. Men's money and power coerce women's submission to sexual harassment, both in and out of prostitution. And women in prostitution bear the brunt of male supremacy. Yet, as Giobi explained to me the other day, Prostitution is set apart from everything that people are me tooing about. And she said, if Weinstein's accusers had been women in prostitution, there would be no public outcry, no worldwide protest against men's sexual predation. Weinstein and Trump are no different from everyday Johns said survivor Vanita Carter in Minneapolis. They rape women because they can, telling themselves and the public that she wanted it or liked it or that she's making money for it. The narcissistic delusion that sexual harassment, rape, and prostitution are her free choice or consensual this is the engine that keeps prostitution and the subordination of all women running smoothly. That delusion defines all of us women as whores. Men in the highest government offices deny and dismiss their predatory behavior as locker room talk, boys will be boys, just the way things are. Their behavior actually sometimes often cannot be distinguished from the behavior of predatory sex buyers, except that the sex buyers are paying to do the sexual harassment and the rape. 
Elisa Bernard, a survivor in Washington, in the U.S., Seattle, Washington, said that prostitution is the very definition of a hostile work environment. Yet what men do to women in prostitution is not challenged as illegal. In some places, it's even defined as work for those who have no other survival options. I can barely imagine the pain of having the world see sexual abuse as your job. Yet that's the reality that's shoved onto women in prostitution. A Canadian woman said, what's rape for others is normal for us. Every rape of every prostituted woman matters. If a sex act was unwanted, pressured, coerced, or performed because she was desperate for food, clothes, or a place to stay out of the rain, that's coerced sex. That's rape. The harm of prostitution is psychological as well as physical. Women in prostitution are seen as body parts or fake girlfriends whose feelings are irrelevant. They're not considered fully human. This commodification and dehumanization of women in prostitution causes her to disappear as a person. When a woman gets dressed up as a prostitute, it doesn't come from her own needs. She becomes the physical manifestation of some men's fantasies about women and sex. She's subordinate and sexually available. Her name changes, her appearance changes, her body movements change, and her voice changes. As Norwegian women in prostitution have said, she turns into something for the sex buyer to empty himself into. Now, the emotional consequences of prostitution are the same in varying cultures, whether it's high class or low class, legal or illegal in a brothel, strip club, street, or massage parlor. We interviewed 854 women, men, and trans women from Canada, Colombia, Germany, Mexico, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, U.S., and Zambia. 75% had been homeless at some point in their lives. When I talk about prostitution and people want to become activists, one of the things I say to them is if you become a housing rights activist, you are a prostitution rights activist because that's what people need in prostitution. They need stable long-term housing in many parts of the world. Is that true here too? I think, yeah. Um, in, in these nine, oops, in nine countries on five continents, two thirds of women, men, and trans women in prostitution met diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. This level of extreme emotional distress is the same as the most emotionally traumatized groups of people ever studied by psychologists. Battered women, raped women, combat veterans, and survivors of state-sponsored torture. Symptoms of emotional distress in all prostitution are just off the charts. Depression, suicidality, PTSD, dissociation, substance abuse, and eating disorders. The dissociation is necessary <clears throat> so that she can survive the prostitution, so that she can, uh, b -b -b let me catch up with myself. Um, it, the dissociation is necessary so that she can create another part of herself who does the prostituting, the not me part. 
The real me is someone who's a mom, a student, somebody's child. Prostitution, dissociation and prostitution was usually originally a survival response to childhood sexual assault. Survivors explained to us, it was easy for me to turn a trick because I could just take myself out like with my dad. It was like I took myself out of the situation and just focused on something else, and it was like I wasn't even there. Whether it's the trauma is slavery, incest, military combat, or prostitution, dissociation permits psychological survival. It's almost a job requirement for prostitution. And if you don't dissociate psychologically, you dissociate chemically by using drugs and alcohol. I don't think any of us could survive it without that. Um, many men who buy sex want to play act the kind of relationship that they are unable or unwilling to have with non-prostituting women. Sometimes they call it a girlfriend experience. If they construct an imaginary, pleasant, emotional relationship in their own mind with a woman they buy for sex, then they can retain their opinion of themselves as nice guys. Yet, these men cause prostituted women great emotional damage since they demand extensive and exhausting lies from the women. As survivor activist Rachel Moran wrote to the nice sex buyer, and I'm quoting, the truth that you're so desperate to flee from is that you're just like a gentle rapist. The damage you're causing is incalculable, but you tell yourself you're doing no harm here, and you use the smiles of the women you buy as some kind of currency. They allow you to buy your own bullshit. I didn't want to be held by you. I didn't want to be cuddled. I didn't want you close to me, never mind inside me. Your arms around me made me want to puke more than your penis ever did. I shut out that part. It was too horrible. Every moment with you was a lie, and I hated every second of it. One of the big lies about prostitution is that it's voluntary. But the evidence simply isn't there. On the other hand, there's lots of evidence that almost everyone in prostitution is there because of a lack of alternatives. For example, we interviewed 18, we reviewed 18 reports on pimping in Europe and North America and Asia. And just talking about adult prostitution now, on average, according to these 18 separate reports, 84% of people were pimped or trafficked or generally under the control of a third party, which is the definition of pimping in the US. Supporting these reports from NGOs and governmental agencies is the, is the statement of Sigma Huda, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Children. And she has said that most of the time, prostitution meets the legal definition of trafficking. Most of us can't tell the difference between prostitution and trafficking just by looking. It's a very difficult thing. Um, we now have research on trends in 150 different countries by economists Chu and Dreher. Their studies show that in 150 countries, wherever prostitution is legal, trafficking increases. Legal prostitution is not a real choice because the conditions that permit genuine consent are not there. That would be physical safety, equal power with sex buyers, and real alternatives. 
In prostitution, one person wants sex and the other doesn't. The money persuades, entices, and coerces the person to perform sex. We really need an understanding of how coercion operates in women's lives. A woman who's fleeing a community where there are few jobs for women and goes to where she thinks she can make money quickly to send home, this is a form of coercion into prostitution. A homeless woman who in exchange for food and shelter submits to compensated sexual assault. If you imagine a pyramid, remember that only 5% of everybody in prostitution is at the top of the pyramid. These are people who are usually privileged by education, class, and race, and they usually have options for escape, like a relative who, after the second gang rape, will say, okay, you can crash in my apartment. The other 95% do not have viable alternatives. Nonetheless, a sex buyer said, if I don't see a chain on her leg, I assume she's made the choice to be there. So if there's no evidence of force, blood, broken bones, bruises that are visible, her experience is dismissed as voluntary or consenting. Let me talk a little bit about sex buyers now. Knowing that women in prostitution have been exploited, coerced, or pimped does not deter sex buyers. We asked many questions about this to a group of London sex buyers, and half of them said they had used a woman who they knew was under the control of a pimp or trafficker. They see, and yet at the same time refuse to see, the coercion, the terror, the disgust, and the despair in the women they buy for sex. If she doesn't run screaming out of the room yelling, police, help, then she's assumed to have consented to the prostitution. Uh, do I have 15 more minutes? Or how am I doing on time? Good? Okay. <laughs> So just as batterers justify beatings of women, men who use women in prostitution develop elaborative cognitive schemes to justify their purchase and use of women. Batterers justify beating women by telling us that she asked for it or provoked it. Sex buyers justify prostitution by telling us she's getting rich or she's simply doing a necessary but unpleasant job like factory worker. Sex buyers, pimps, and sex trade advocates acknowledge a small fraction of the abuse and exploitation, but justify the abuse because the women are alleged to make a lot of money. I remember one sex buyer said, yeah, I know her pimp is raping her, but it's only once a month or so. It's not every day. And once it's paid for, the exploitation, the abuse, and the psychological viciousness are disappeared. Like women who are blamed for provoking men into beating them, women who fail to provide the sex acts demanded by their partners are blamed for their partner's use of women in prostitution. One sex buyer said, well, if my fiancé won't give me anal, I know someone who will. Referring to a special class of human beings who are set aside for anal. Uh, this is one of a, an amazing study done by... Uh, a group from ProMundo and a number of other NGOs looking at what are the societal factors that cause men to rape? Very important questions. 
they had these huge samples of people they were asking. A thousand men in Chile, a thousand in Croatia, India, Mexico, and Rwanda. In all five countries, men who had ever paid for sex were more likely to commit rape against non-prostituting women. Sex buyers, like sexually aggressive men, tend to prefer in person. We, we did a study comparing men who buy sex with a matched sample of men who don't buy sex. They were matched by age, education, ethnicity. And we found that compared to men who don't buy sex, sex buyers had a lot of characteristics in common with 30 years of studies of sexually aggressive men by psychologists. Sex buyers tend to prefer impersonal or non-relational sex, and they have way more sex partners than men who don't buy sex, out of prostitution as well as in prostitution. Sex buyers more often tend to fear rejection by women. Of course, the prostitution gives them control over that variable. Sex buyers tend to have committed sexually aggressive acts in the past. They have a hostile masculine self-identification. That's things like they identify as men because of their capacity to have power over another person. They're, it's kind of what we think of as toxic masculinity these days. Their ability to keep women in line. They don't trust women. And um, they have a, a level of insecurity that the non-sex buyers don't have. They also told us that they would be more likely to rape a woman if they knew they could get away with it. So I think sex buyers are a model for sex predation. The, the cues studied by psychologists as warning signs for rape are precisely those behaviors shown by men who buy sex. An attitude of sexual entitlement, unwanted touching, persistence, and social isolation. As a result, prostituted women have the highest rate of rape on the planet. The dilemma for those who wield power in the sex trade is to hide its cruelty and to make it palatable to people who use it and those who watch human beings as they're cruelly exploited. Why is prostitution so invisible, even though it's right there in plain sight? A survivor of prostitution once explained to me, it's like incest, no one wants to talk about it. Many people, I think, and I understand this, many people can't bear to look at the despair the vastness of the physical and psychological harm to the prostituted, it's just too painful, too cruel, and too heartless. In prostitution, you have to say you like the rape. And women who get out of prostitution later tell us that saying these words of pleasure to those who are tormenting them is a nightmare. Some words that are commonly used to refer to prostitution cover up its cruelty. The expression migrant sex work and sex tourism imply that prostitution is just another job which women do. And just as the words field worker and assistant planter were actually used to deny the harms of slavery, so also the concept of sex work disappears the violence in prostitution. The big lies from pimps, sex buyers, and their political allies can seem overwhelming. But evidence regarding the harms of prostitution from 
exited survivors, not those who are under the control of pimps or paid off by sex trade capitalists. The words of exit, exited survivors are a big problem for them. The testimony of survivors is critical and the truth provided by anonymous sex buyers in research interviews absolutely destroys the notion that prostitution is a service provided by sex workers. As a Scottish sex buyer said in an interview, prostitution is where men have the freedom to do anything they want in a consequence free environment. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I've been worrying about time all day. Um, so bureaucracies, management, tracking, policies, registries, union, legalization, none of this will change what's wrong with prostitution. It's so deeply abusive and violent an institution that it can only be abolished, not fixed. In 2014, two Tilburg University criminologists called in a peer-reviewed article for, quote, additional legislation such as the criminalization of clients is necessary to compensate for the shortcomings of regulatory measures. Now, what I agree. The Nordic model law has now been passed in eight countries. We're not just talking about Sweden here. We're talking about a global movement to shift our understanding of the sex trade. And th those laws would do three things. I'm in favor of anyone, one of which is in place right here already, and that is I'm strongly in favor of decriminalizing people in prostitution. They should never be arrested. And that's good that they're not arrested here. However, I am in favor of criminalizing sex buyers, holding them accountable. And I'm in favor of something that, at least in the US and a number of countries, it's hard to get sufficient funding for, which are exit services for people who want to get out. I know you have some funding here. I know more has been uh, allocated for exit services. That's great. No doubt we need more. And it's hard in these economic times for governments to make a decision to spend money on that, but they should if they care about the human rights. Um, I want to mention a couple things, and I have, I have some handouts here with a lot more information on it, which I will leave up here, and I'm happy for anybody to take. It's actually about how, or maybe I'll put it over here, it's about the similarity between climate science denial, we all know about that, we really do know about that in the US. We've got a president who's denying that climate disruption is even existing, but he's not alone. There's a huge number of people in the world that deny the facts. I am suggesting that the same arguments used to question the science about climate science, the same arguments used to say, can you be 100% sure of that fact? Of course we can't. No scientist ever can. I can't tell you that the sun is going to come up tomorrow, but I can tell you there's a very high probability that it will. So there are parallel arguments that cause doubt in people's mind about the very facts in front of them. Just as climate disruption is named extreme weather events, so also prostitution is named a choice, a victimless crime, or from a sugar dating website, we offer a wide range of personal meeting and relationship opportunities. Exxon has spent billions to deny the facts of climate change. 
and public relation campaigns are now being run by well-funded sex trade advocates. Scientific evidence is denied or marginalized, and research is again and again branded controversial. That's the word that's inserted into description of studies that no one in the field is arguing with. But Wikipedia is a prime example of this. With anonymous editors skewing and biasing facts and deleting information, Wikipedia pages are often monitored. I don't know if you know this. It took me a long time to learn this, but I finally understand it. Wikipedia pages are monitored and edits are reversed by robots within 30 seconds of making a fact correction by biased and paid advocates who are pushing a certain political perspective on prostitution. Paid lobbyists, furthermore, or astroturfers, do you know that term, fake grassroots campaigns? We really have come to understand that in the US because it generated a president that we're all in shock about. Fake campaigns. What these paid lobbyists do online mainly these days, Twitter, social, other social media, they attack journalists and they attack news organizations who report stories that they disagree with and they attack politicians who ask tough questions. Doubt is created about the facts. So pornography and prostitution have defined what a woman is, and as a result, the line which was assumed to exist between prostitution and not prostitution is becoming invisible. Me Too is an example of that disappeared line. No one understands that better than exited survivors of prostitution. Listen carefully to them. And I want to end by quoting former Amsterdam Councilwoman Karina Skopman. I'm sorry for my accent. The Councilwoman some time ago exited prostitution and now and spoke about it. She said, there are people who are really proud of the red light district as a tourist attraction. It's supposed to be such a wonderful, cheery place that shows just what a free city we are. But I think it's a cesspit, she said. There's a lot of serious criminality. There's a lot of exploitation and a lot of social distress. There's nothing to be proud of. That's the end of her quote. And I want to tell you that when I return home, and the first question people ask me about Amsterdam is, did you visit the red light district? I'm gonna say, no, I did not. Instead, I spoke with a survivor of legal prostitution who told me about some of her experiences. And I spoke with advocates for the right of women to exist without prostitution. Thank you. Thank you. Should I come over there? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in about 30 minutes, the stage is yours, and we will be listening to questions from the public. Okay. First, we'll have a short conversation. Okay, I'm going to take my homework. Hope I brought it. Can you explain why, whenever the word prostitution is mentioned, emotions go sky high? What's your explanation for that? Uh, 
I mean, I could tell you for myself and what I imagine other people think. I think it's that phenomenon of there's so much intuitive awareness of what exactly it is. People in the public think to themselves, not me, not my daughter, not my sister or cousin. And yet at the same time, they want to be, I, I mean, what are the names we're called? <laughs> They don't want to be a sexual prude. They want to be progressive. All of these things that, that people are called when they say, I think that institution is kind of more like slavery than sexual freedom. And it creates a conflict, I think. But I don't know. I mean, it, it gets me disturbed in the same way I would be disturbed if I was looking at a plantation and in the U.S., if I was living back in the days of slavery, and I was looking at a plantation with people who had a different color skin from me, and they were being whipped in the field or raped because they were in the house serving food. I mean, very disturbing. You were already, you mentioned <clears throat> being progressive, being a true liberal. Um, some people think that the outcome of your surveys is determined by your morality and not so much scientific objectivity. Uh, have you ever heard these people? I think so. <laughs> you know their critique? Um, I have been accused w w of not thinking or something or bias. Well, like it's your it's yeah, bias. bias. It's yeah. your morality defining yeah. the outcome of your survey. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole philosophy of research among psychologists. And that is that we feel, and it's written in our ethical guidelines, if you're a researcher, you're obliged to make your assumptions clear. You're obliged to say, this is what I'm looking at, and this is what I'm testing and investigating, and this is how I measured it. And you even um, and this is what's happened with our research, it's been replicated by many other people, which is a hard test. Um, so you say... So that I, I guess what I'm saying is I have a position about prostitution that it is a form of violence against women, and then I'm going to go out to the best of my ability and ask as many people as I can in as many different types of prostitution that I can access, what is your opinion about this? Have you been, experienced this? What do you think about that? I guess I would just say um, we're not, these are research studies and are not opinion surveys of two people who say, I love sex work. Yet, I do want to mention this. Tonight, before this evening started, outside this building, we had some women of the Proud uh, movement demonstrating. And they have raised their voices the last couple of days, saying, uh, Dear Melissa Farley, who are you to say that there is no such thing as free will when it comes to me selling my body or selling sex for money? Who are you? Because, sorry? Selling service, someone says. Selling service. Okay, well, is it okay if, I want to hear you later, is that okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm not selling my body, I'm selling a service, this woman is saying. But they're saying, nonetheless, that was my issue. You are victimizing all of us. Why are you not more specific? Because you could say, as Amnesty International is suggesting, um, we, we want more attention for the, for the severe problem of human trafficking, but we do want sex workers to do their work without being criminalized. So maybe the both can exist in the same world. As I said, I'm in favor of decriminalization of prostitution. I, I don't want anyone criminalized who's selling sex. However, 
It is my opinion and observation that many of the voices advocating prostitution as sex work are a small minority. It's the 5%. Of, it's the 5%. I, I'm not going to argue with someone who says, I want to do this, this is my choice, blah, blah, blah. Is it true, and I would require that I have the right to represent what I have learned from the other 95%, their opinions, their needs, their feelings about prostitution are frequently not represented in this. And so what I would say is I'm not pretending to represent the 5% who are saying prostitution is a service and blah, blah, blah. But I'm re I am representing the voices of the others. Um, maybe because I think that's fair. I know it's not how we planned this, but um, does the person who was talking to me or to Melissa about selling a service want to respond? Like, I mean, come on, is that even like... Sorry, can you, can you, can you repeat response? that with the microphone? Can you even respond to someone who says, oh, it's selling a service, blah, blah, blah. Like, come on, what am I going to respond to that? If she can't say anything just with, with using her brain, then I cannot either, I'm sorry. But you don't feel the point that she's making that she's talking about the 95%? She is not that... representing the 95%, definitely not. Absolutely not, she is not. Why not? Because where are they then? I'm well, sorry. That are you really going to pretend like you are the authority on sex work or, or the authority of, of victims of human trafficking? No, you are not. But maybe it's not so hard to imagine that victims of human trafficking cannot be here tonight, at least not out of free will. Or is that a strange thought? Well, I no. just wanted you to respond to this specific point because otherwise you didn't get the chance to react to uh, Melissa's. It's, uh, it's mostly ridiculous to me, for me to assume that someone like her knows what the 95% is going through. It's, it's ridiculous. Point taken. Um, if you abolish prostitution, what would be or what is the proven benefit of that policy? So the Nordic model, for example. With, with many survivors of human rights violations, we listen to what they tell us they want. In our studies in nine countries on five continents of large number of people in prostitution, the first thing they tell us they want is to get out. So that's the first thing. Yeah, that's the we, exit programs. We respect that statement from them. That's the end of the story. We respect that. And then we say, what do you need? And we've asked them, what do you need in order to get out? And this is where we hear that they are in need of housing, support from other survivors for exiting. Frequently in the pro-sex trade groups, what's offered is condoms and a cup of coffee and a union, which unfortunately in the Netherlands, no one's joining is my understanding because of a desire to get out, not to stay in prostitution. Most people in prostitution are in it because it's an emergency survival option. What I would say, and this is a criticism that's been given to those of us who favor shutting down the institution. The criticism has been leveled, and I think it's a valid one. If you're going to take that away from us, how are you going to help us find a job to stay alive? I think it's an extremely important question. And I am in favor of working with any group who wants to provide options, alternatives, and support for women who choose to exit prostitution. I hear this voice, I choose to be in prostitution. I recognize that. As, as someone's opinion, do you recognize, I would ask 
the people who are favoring the sex trade, do you recognize the need for support for women to exit? Because that's very important, as I understand it. Yeah, but then <clears throat> my question was more, I was aiming more at the political situation, like oh. the legalization versus Nordic model, for example, or just blank abolishment. Like, I'm sorry. To just, no, 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 it's no problem. No. But I was wondering, the idea behind legalization, for example, was there will be people selling sex probably forever because they've been here forever. Mm -hmm. So by legalizing it, at least we can try to regulate part of it. Without doing that, how do you regulate anything? You just make it go underground. So what, in your opinion, it are the benefits of forbidding it? to stop this is, legalizing it. This is one of the lies that is perpetuated, that it's going to go underground. It can't go that far underground because it's a business and it has to advertise. And as a smart mouth police officer in Sweden once said to me, if the sex buyers can find the prostitution, so can the detectives and so can the egg people offering exit services. So. It is not true that it goes underground, but um, the argument that something has been around forever is not a particularly strong intellectual argument. Uh, murder has been around forever, and it's probably going to be around a long time. Rape has been around forever, and it's probably going to be around a long time. Does that mean we say, well, let's pass a law that makes it a little better? Does that mean we pass a law that says, well, it's okay to batter a woman and bruise her, but not break her arm? I don't think, I don't think that's where we should go with this. I think if we think an institution is harmful, it's better to end it and offer something else. Well, just the way we did with slavery uh, and certain colonial enterprises in the world. What's your explanation for the fact that you call it a worldwide movement by now? Eight countries have adopted the Nordic model. Mm -hmm. uh, why is this happening? What is changing? What is, what is causing this movement? I would have to give a huge amount of credit to organized groups of survivors who've educated the rest of us. And I want to say that most of what I know about prostitution comes from being taught about it formally in research studies and informally with many, many years of my life sitting down with, listening to, and working with survivors. They've educated us, and our whole understanding of what it is has shifted. Um, I didn't know anything about prostitution 25 years ago, and there were very few voices explaining it. So I, I guess that's one answer to that. That, and maybe, do you think that we're becoming smarter, that we're just learning more about the effects, for example, of legalization? Yes, and we're learning how to understand the many, many structures in the culture, in, in the high-tech industry that are designed to keep not only my voice, but importantly, to keep the voices of exited survivors who have a valid critique of the institution silent. You know, I have a lot of privilege in society but it makes me very, very angry when survivors of prostitution are intimidated, bullied, and insulted by others who choose to support the institution of prostitution. And I would say all of us need to respond to that by saying, how dare you do that? That's not okay. We need to hear from voices of survivors who disagree with you. I don't, I'm not going to go into the hours of examples I have of how I've seen that played out, but it is truly vicious. 
Looking at the Netherlands and our policy, I assume you're aware of the way we've organized things. Do you think there's anything other countries can learn from our case? Is there anything positive about what we're doing? You can try it. Um, I, in, in Berkeley, when there was a campaign to decriminalize prostitution in 2008, we had a city councilwoman who said, who at first said, decriminalize prostitution, that sounds like a good idea, it'll make it better, it'll reduce the harm. And then we had some meetings with her and she learned a lot more about prostitution, and she publicly came out and stated, I made a mistake. I, I am going to correct my political view of prostitution, and I'm going to change my mind. Now, I have long admired one of the former mayors of Amsterdam, Job Cohen, who said, we thought in 2000, that it would help reduce the harm. And we made a mistake. I mean, what's better than a politician who, acknowledge, who can learn something and move on? I mean, we don't have them, <laughs> have them <laughs> in our country, <laughs> but you do. Well, some. You can teach us. <laughs> I, I, mm, don't be too positive. <laughs> I'm thinking if you really want to make, um, how do you say it, a constructive, like I think what connects both the uh, pro-activists and the anti-activists is that they're both concerned about women or men in prostitution. Like that's what connects the dots, right? You don't have a different opinion about the fact that human, traffic, human trafficking is evil, that rape is evil, that any kind of violence is evil. Am I correct? Do you think that's... I think there are points of agreement. Um, what, what are the points of agreement? The, point, the points of agreement, I hope, I want to see more evidence of it because I'm a skeptic. Uh, points of agreement are that people should have a choice, that women should have basic rights like housing, food, uh, job training. I think there is agreement on that. I don't hear it enough, but when I push very hard, I have heard that. What I want to see is activism on women's right to choose not to prostitute, as well as those who choose to prostitute. When I see an array of alternatives, I'll, I'll believe that we're really on solid ground. I was thinking about the positive effects of our policy, and I'm going to help you there. Okay, thank what's you. What's very, no, 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 what's very striking. I'll take help. Now, if you, now, when I was in Sweden, mm -hmm. what I found out was actually that every uh, program taking care of prostitutes leaving prostitution, it's all done by unpaid workers. The state of Sweden is uh, hardly investing anything in taking care of women, and I find that so striking since they claim their policy is all about these women. They need to spend more money on hiring people, offering exit services. I agree. But don't you think that's strange? <clears throat> like they focus on criminalizing the sex buyer so much that they're not investing in the well-being of the prostitute. And I, I hear think... you, you know, saying we have to start criminalizing sex buyers. And invest more in women's exit services. I agree. I agree. I think there's, I, I, as I understand it, there's just been a decision to increase state funding for exit services in the Netherlands. I applaud that. I think that's wonderful. And, and I would criticize Sweden for not doing that enough. I agree.
if you think about the situation as it is right now, so in Holland, prostitution is legal. What do you think we can do to optimize the circumstances in which people are working today? Like if you just leave the idea of, of it being a bad thing, how can you work from here to make things better? Um, I would say that I agree with the idea of harm reduction programs. I'm in favor of harm reduction programs. All of the condom distribution you can possibly imagine. <laughs> All of the needle distribution that anybody wants. Decreasing the stigma of prostitution so people aren't looked down upon. Human beings are not looked down upon as if they're a piece of trash. I agree with all of that. So I agree with harm reduction. I would just go a little further and say we have to offer the option, as well as harm reduction, of harm elimination. Does that, that should be an option too. So there, there's areas of agreement. Um, it has not been my experience, although I have personally friendly relationships and respectful relationships with some people who advocate the sex trade, we do not have a lot of areas where we're working together because there's such a f over emphasis on you have to promote prostitution, you have to say this. There's like a lockstep dogma about it to me, a resistant to accepting any criticism. I mean, there's been a majority voice in the Netherlands for 17 years. And some of us who object to it are not even allowed to open our mouths without a protest. Come on. It's a democracy. You're like, you have been talking for 17 years. Now it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just to get that clear. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? Oh, here. Is there, kun jij? Of ben ik veel te vroeg? You use the word survivor uh, many times. Now, I suppose that the non-survivors are not all dead. So what exactly is the survivor and what is the non-survivor then in prostitution? It's a, it's a good question, the use of the term survivor. I, we're always struggling for better words to use. I mean, the point, the point of that word is to say in one word, this is not work. This is a human rights violation that someone has managed to get on the other side of, and good for them. And let's applaud them for their very existence. Um, I don't use the expression non-survivors, so I don't quite know what you mean. If there are survivors, there are non-survivors, I suppose. Who are oh. dead? You mean? Uh, that's what I'm asking you. What, what, who are the non-survivors then? Victims, maybe? Because that's another word. There is there is a devastatingly high incidence of women, men, and trans women who do not survive the institution of prostitution, from suicide, homicide by pimps and johns. We all. All of us in this movement know way too many stories. So I guess that's, those are people that I would describe as non-survivors. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. We're just waiting. And oh yeah, if you can, this was actually very constructive, a true question. So that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm interested in hearing what people. Sorry? I'm interested in hearing what people have yeah, to Ms. say. Okay, too. you're talking. Miss um, Farley, my question needs a little bit of introduction. 
In uh, 87, I became a police officer in the red light district. In 88, I brought a Yugoslavian woman to the headquarters because she was forced to do the job. In 1994, I joined the red light police uh, prostitution team and we registered all the women in the windows to find out who they are and if they needed any help. And the reason was because there was a Brazilian girl stabbed to death in uh, the blood street. In 2001, I quit my job, and one of the things I was missing in your uh, story was that we uh, uh, made uh, an estimate figure of what the money that was uh, 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 made in one year, and we came to a figure of 86 million guilders, and I'm talking about 1995 now. Uh, 2001, I quit my job because I want to become a civilian so I can speak without harming my corpse. It makes me a bit emotional, but I will continue. Uh, after 2001, I continued to follow the, the whole prostitution problem. And uh, one of the things you were talking about was that you are uh, saying that men are pretty aggressive. And now, uh, about a year ago, two years ago, and that's my question then, uh, two women, very smart women, one is an ex-politician, one is a, a very, uh, she's a businesswoman, they recently opened a, a, a brothel with the help of some men, and they put money in this brothel to give a safe environment to those women. My first thought was, if you, if you want to uh, put money into uh, women, why don't you give them a job uh, training or whatever so they can have another job? And now my question is, is it possible that uh, women are afraid to be victims uh, of uh, rape and uh, uh, all those sexual abuse? And then that, then that's the reason they don't speak out against prostitution. I hope you understand uh, my question. <laughs> So is it because they were Thank brutalized you. that they're not speaking out? Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, it, it makes me think of a couple things. One, I haven't made the clear statement that not all men are sex buyers. Sometimes people assume I'm saying all men are sex buyers. Not the case at all. And um, I appreciate that. Second. As in your life, it's been my experience, too, that police officers, vice detectives, are some of the most important advocates that women in prostitution have for escape. It, I've been deeply touched, and I, several friends of mine have had their lives saved by police officers who grabbed them and jumped into a car with them when a pimp was beating them to death. So thank you for what you've done. Um, uh, I, one other thing I want to say that I am aware that there are significant numbers of women pimps. There are even women pimps who present themselves as sex workers these days when they're in fact pimping other women. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, email one of the organizers of this conference and I will send you a list of 12 women pimps in eight countries who have had charges levied against them for trafficking or pimping in the US. Um, so I I mean, your, your statement is important, thank you. I don't. I, he was telling yeah. about this initiative. Uh, I, if I understood you correctly, uh, uh, partly uh, financed by. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I understand that. That's, yes. that's the question I want to ask you because here yeah, we have sorry. been discussing yeah. this model of maybe organizing it through cooperations. Like, yeah. make women the owners of their own cooperations, no pimps allowed, no layers in between who have financial benefits, only these women in charge of their own businesses. What's wrong with that? Because on the ground, as the UN rapporteur said, on the ground, the fact is, 
a vast majority of people who say, I'm in sex work, I like it, I'm making a choice. 84% of adults in prostitution have a third party control, called a boyfriend, husband, not a pimp, they're not called pimps, but it's where the money goes. Follow the money is everything in this field. It has to be followed. And if someone gives, do we have any idea of the amount of money circling through uh, I, the industry? I, would, I, I, I worked with a large group of people in the state of Nevada, where, as you know, we have legal prostitution. And that was a burning question in my mind. I mean, the first thing we found in Nevada, like so many other parts of the world, including the Netherlands, is even in Australia, uh, even when prostitution is legal, and especially when it's legal, the illegal industry increases. So, for example, most people don't know that prostitution is not legal in Las Vegas. We did a survey of tourists in Las Vegas. Is prostitution legal here? Half of them thought it was. It's not. Why isn't it? It's an archaic law in the state of Nevada. They want prostitution to exist, but they want it out of the public eye and out of the eyes of tourists. So the law says in Nevada, you can only have prostitution where there is a county of less than 400,000 people. That excludes two places in Nevada, Reno and Las Vegas, the biggest population centers. So you have to drive away. Okay. Any more but, questions? Oh, oh, sorry. No, no, I'll, finish I'll your... No, no, it's okay. Yeah? I was going to say about the money. Oh, so me, yeah, Las Vegas prostitution is illegal, but very socially mainstreamed. And we interviewed cab drivers, uh, the Russian mafia uh, members who control the taxi business in Las Vegas, and um, investigative reporters, U.S. police, Nevada police, Las Vegas police, they all had a similar estimate that the total income from one city, Las Vegas, alone, was pushing six billion billion dollars U.S. a year, and this was ten years ago. So that's a lot of money, tax free. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's such a contentious issue. There's a lot of money Lonnie involved. Have a lot of money involved. Thank you very much because. Um, it's nice to have uh, such a clear uh, view on things as you have got. So it's easy also when, when for me, we, who doesn't agree with it, uh, to make a stand. Um, for instance, I have two questions to you. When you say, when you make a definition of prostitution, um, the, uh, prostitution is the business of sexual exploitation, then, you, yeah, then the circle is already closed and it's a kind of slavery which has to be abolished. Why don't you say service? Um, that's really a question. Maybe it's semantic, but I hope not. Why don't you say prostitution is the business of sexual services? And then you get an other framework. And, my, and then the second question... Shall, shall we do the first one first? No, but it goes together, this conceptual. Oh, it goes together, okay. Uh, uh, if prostitution is the model for a uh, women's condition, and it's you, it was on the... You wrote it there, Evelyn Jobbe, Evelina Jobbe. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it really seems that your framework is very patriarchal, and there has not been no feminism and no women's liberation. It brings me back to the 50s in Limburg, where I was born in the south of Holland. And we only had choices as a Madonna or a mother or a whore for women. And there was nothing. So uh, please, can you, um, can you agree with me that I can see your framework as very patriarchal view on women? Sorry? Thank you for those questions. 
I mean, the first one is quicker than the second. The first question about why I don't use the word service, because it's a word that makes invisible the exploitation and abuse, just like the word work. Calling it a service work, service industry, um, that's why I don't use it. Now, the second one, am, is it patriarchal to say that prostitution is the model for women's condition? Is that throwing us back to the 50s and the 40s? I guess what I would say, pardon my bluntness, is that spreading your legs at someone else's command is about as patriarchal as you can get. That's not liberation. Equality, and let me say, I think sex is great. I think it's a good thing. I like it. <laughs> We're not talking about sex from the woman's perspective. Does she get to say what she wants? sexually in prostitution and get paid for it? If he says, give me a blow job, and she says, well, I'd rather have a, this, I don't think that's going to happen. I've never heard of it happening. Myrthe, I have a reaction here. Op. Is that okay? Yeah, tuurlijk. You look at it. This so the last one is really semantic, because I thought you were meaning what Evelina Jobber was saying. The model for women's condition on earth is prostitution, and I interpreted that she was saying all women are prostitutes. The, 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 the women's position in the world is based on the model of prostitution. So I got that, uh, that's why I got angry about it. It's maybe a misunderstanding, but it's really important. It is, it's an, it's an incredibly important statement. To be honest, it's taken me years, me, to get my head around that and really understand what she's saying. She, she is uh, in favor of ending the institution of prostitution. And she thinks it's harmful to all women. And she explains exactly how that's the case. And it never fails to deeply touch me when survivors of prostitution are looking out for me, a non-survivor, and wanting to protect me from sexual abuse or rape. But Giobi is somebody who thinks like that. She's thinking about equality for all women and real sexual liberation for all women. I, I'm sorry if it's not Gaan clear. Na, als jij naar een nieuwe vraag stelt, dan ga ik er één vraag tussendoor stellen. How do you define um, slavery? Because there's a lot of debate about that as well. Is that just the theory of, you know, actual trafficking? Or is it um, prostituting because you're addicted in your definition? Or No, it's not prostituting because you're addicted. You know, in the U.S., we have a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery. And I've heard many lawyers explain what that means. Really, what it means on the ground in real life is you're prevented from leaving a condition that's controlled by a third party. Yeah, that's the, de it's the definition the departure of human trafficking. And slavery. And slavery, That's yeah. the U.S. Constitution yeah, on slavery. That, I get that. But I mean, if you say there's this 5% privileged women mm. in the top of the pyramid, mm. and 95, 95% mm. you say, mm -hmm. is not doing this out of free will, mm. then how, what is your definition of free will in this context? I, it's, Because it's a big group. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, remember we're talking about a pyramid and this large number, I wish I had my diagram, I'm sorry I don't, <laughs> but this large number at the bottom of the pyramid are the most oppressed, most harmed, poorest, least options. I mean, they're like a woman I interviewed in Lusaka, Zambia, who described herself as a voluntary sex worker. Keep that in mind. We were chatting 
And at a certain point, she looked at her watch and said, I have to go now because I have to do five blowjobs before 6 p.m. so I can buy a sack of mealy meal to feed my children. Now that's what I would call a form of enslavement by hunger and poverty. But she wasn't calling herself that because she chose to speak with me, get up and walk to perform sex acts in order to get food for her kids. She had had put into her mind that she volunteered for but if you put it. That, I have a problem with that. But if you put that in your mind because you're doing it out of necessity, because you need to do it at that moment in your life, mm -hmm. and you're victimizing this woman who is doing it, maybe in her perception, because she's strong enough to do it, because she wants to feed the children. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's strange that maybe some of these women become angry of you victimizing them? She wasn't angry at me. I would never argue with somebody who's prostituting about what they choose to call themselves. Never. I would see that as disrespectful. I'm having an argument here in, a, in this forum where I hope that all of us are aware that many people in the world consent to their own oppression. Many women consent to a range of forms of oppression. But can we here agree that even if she appears to consent to it, like this woman in Lusaka... That it's still oppression. It's still oppression, exactly. Wait, this is... I have no, a question over going, here. Yeah, we're going to do it. But I'll make sure someone comes with the mic. <laughs> uh, the argument pro-legalization is usual uh, that uh, otherwise it would go underground, yet the conclusion of uh, since 2000 is that b being legalized is still a, a huge increase of the abuse that is out of sight. And uh, my explanation would be then apparently what we see in the windows and in the brothels is the upper uh, uh, side of the iceberg and the question then is uh, was what happened previously above the ground in forms of even the most degrading forms of uh, prostitution uh, asking of women to do deliberate uh, self-humiliating acts or things like live uh, streaming which is, by the way immediately off the web and very hard to trace for police officers because it's only there at the moment it is being performed and it's used in child uh, pornography uh, worldwide uh, and uh, the question is then uh, is the f is the problem that it is very it gets much harder to prove that somebody is abused in this way if you have to prove the actual abuse, if the uh, prostitution as such is prohibited, you only have to prove that it was a case of prostitution. So now we have this wonderful law in Holland that says, uh, well, the Hurenloper, the sex buyer, has to uh, do diligent uh, research on whether the woman is actually a minor or whether she's doing it against her will. Well, he only has to say, well, I, I just didn't recognize it. I mean, how are you going to prove that he didn't uh, uh, come up to the standards? Is it a result? But what's the question? Uh, well, then, is the, uh, can you tell us more about the research uh, that shows that uh, in legal in a situation in le countries where prostitution is legalized, that actually the abuse has increased? And it's can still going underground. That? That's yes. your yeah. Okay. Say that question again. What, if I what? understand it correctly, because... It, <laughs> I mean, thank you for the yeah. points you're making, too. I, no, I like, what's your explanation for the fact that... Oh, my God, I have to look at her at the same time. But if I understand it correctly... Explicit. You say it decrease, increases when it is legal. Now, can you be more specific about how research uh, has found that out and in which way this functions? How has research found that trafficking increases when prostitution uh, the is The London legal? School of Economics uh, survey, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I was referring to. Yeah, can you explain, can you tell her some more about this survey? This is economists, not psychologists. 
and um, it was published in a peer-reviewed magazine, and they're looking at trafficking inflows into 150 countries. How did they do that? I don't think I can explain that quickly, but I can give you the reference. Um, happy to do that. And the main conclusion was? When prostitution is legal, trafficking increases, as in the case of the Netherlands, as in the case of Australia, as in the case of New Zealand. Maybe because it's easier to well, you, have your business in the country where it's legal, of course. You have to think a, a pimp, uh, you have to think the pimp business model. Is it a better business model to go to Sweden where you've got a bunch of exactly. cops saying, we're going to arrest you and we're going to arrest your customers too and get out of town? Or is it better to, to set up shop in a place where you're welcomed as a businessman? Mircea? Nee, ik zou. I, um, I, I, I think we're going to go to the next question. I'm ja. sorry. En ik Is this something voor, maybe for sorry, later at the bar? Er zijn volgens mij nog best veel vragen. Um, ik zie daar helemaal achterin nog. En hiervoor ook. Maar ik weet niet of deze microfoon aangezet kan worden. Dan ja, dat kan. Dat kan. Dan hoef jij niet. Uh, uh, waar wil je dat ik heen ga als eerste? Zal ik hier even één vraag Ja, dat is goed. Te, ja. Thank you so much for your perspective. We've been following your research for a very long time now, Melissa. Um, our question actually is on behalf of a project that is invested in the exit services. So while we are debating about criminalizing and legalizing, our question is um, linked, or rather we request your advice uh, for policymakers. What do you do um, for women who are not from that particular country, therefore undocumented, but are discriminated against uh, by exit services on the grounds that they have this undocumented existence. Because even in the Netherlands, while we do have organizations in place, the minute the woman says that she is undocumented, she is not going to be helped for a long time. And we work with these kind of women and deal with those issues. So while we respect your point of view, what would your advice be to policymakers? That's, it's a huge issue, of course. It's about the, the use of immigration policy to implement prejudicial, abusive immigration policy. We, we see that here and other places as well. I don't know, I, th I don't think women should be forced to return to a country where they're going to definitely be abused and harmed and re-victimized. At the same time, I had a, an, a light bulb go on in my head the other day when I was listening to a group of Nigerian women who are working in the EU with Nigerian women trafficked by pimps to Italy, and especially Italy, and other parts of Europe. The women who are based in Nigeria were saying, why don't you, Netherlands, US, Italy, why don't you hold trafficking source countries more accountable? because you have to have corrupt politicians, corrupt immigration officials, everyone's bought and paid for when a pimp gets on an airplane with three 12-year-olds who have questionable papers. Who's turning a blind eye to that? And these women are, are saying that they feel that they want more pressure on source countries. We're, we, we're focused on destination countries for trafficking, but it was a really interesting perspective, I th isn't it? And Sorry. Sorry. I, we have another question. Big, I don't sorry, have it's an, time. I don't have an answer to that first one. I'm sorry. Hi. I don't. Thank you for showing light to this topic. Um, my question is, in the Netherlands, prostitution is legalized, but there's a shift going on now uh, with this bill, who is stated as follows, if the sex buyer knew or should have known that the lady or 
man is a victim of human traffic, he should have, there's a punishment on it. Uh, there's a lot of critique about it because how could you know that the lady or the man is a victim of human traffic and what kind of signals should he have seen? My question is, what do you think about this bill going on? Do you know on? the law she's referring to? It's uh, designed by Gert-Jan Segers, I believe you had dinner yesterday evening with him. No? <laughs> Good oh. try, but oh. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wrong informed, damn it. Um, Although I respect some much of his thinking. Yeah, it's, well, it's his law, and it's saying that. Oh, um, <laughs> I didn't know that. Any client who could have known, or should have known, that there's maybe some kind of slavery <laughs> going on, and is not mentioning in it, he's punishable. Um. It's, but how it's, it's an attempt at, control, at reducing pimping, which is an abusive institution. That's another thing that we all agree on. Pimping and trafficking is abusive. I think it's an attempt at that. I have an issue with any law that attempts to hold somebody accountable for what's in their head. Uh, I would rather hold them accountable for the behavior specific behaviors. You do this, you're going to get arrested. You buy sex, it's a criminal act. You know, you sell another person into the sex trade, that's a criminal act. I don't care how old they are or how, what you knew or didn't know or what you say you knew. Or didn't. What would you do if you were busted by the police I mean, if there's one refrain that we hear from men who buy sex in locations where it's illegal to buy sex, it's, well, I didn't know. I was just trying to set up a date. You know, that's what they always say, the first thing. And then they start crying and say, please don't tell my wife. <laughs> Seriously, I, I'm not being sarcastic. That is the second thing they say. <laughs> or girlfriend. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. She okay, wants well, to know whether you asked the, 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 women, the woman in Lusaka if she would do another job if she had the chance. Oh, I didn't mention that we were sitting there and we were on our way to an NGO that offers housing, job training, and support. So yes, she wanted out. She did. I mean, I knew that about her. Thank you for the question. We have a, another question. I mean, she. Well, let me just say yeah. one thing. She was still in prostitution, but she wanted out, which is the condition and the state of so many women. And it usually takes, in the US, I didn't know this at first, it takes six to eight attempts to get out. It's, it's easy to get into prostitution, it's very hard to get out. And we need to understand that it takes a lot of attempts. Oh yeah, the first, yeah. Um, well, I have a question for you. Um, referring to the Amnesty International, who is an organization um, and, uh, who are advocating for um, decriminalization, and it is an organization who knows everything about human rights, I think. Um, I'm doing a PhD research in, um, uh, and oh, I'm uh, investigating the effects of the decriminalization policy in New Zealand. You are doing uh, that on behalf of Amnesty International? No, 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 I'm not doing that on okay. behalf of... Sorry. No. Um, <laughs> New Zealand decriminalized, for the people here, the New Zealand decriminalized the, voluntary, uh, the, the entire voluntary sex industry in 2003, um, meaning that um, um, uh, clients and uh, women all are decriminalized. Um, it changed from a, a, a terrible um, situation for sex workers to an, it, it is a tremendous change of um, sex workers who got their rights and who, who know that they have rights. And um, um, let's be short about the results of research. It shows that um, the, um, 
health care, that self-determination, um, that violence, um, that safety of sex workers went uh, improved very much. How can you how can you explain that? Thanks. Oh, sorry, sorry, if sorry. If we start sorry. yelling, Excuse I me. think that's... Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're gonna... No, I think you don't. No, I, no, I mean, I don't think it's up to you to decide if yelling is okay. Let's please listen to each other. No, really, this is a serious request. He's asking a normal question about the New I'm, Zealand I'm sorry, model. I'm going to say something as well as a program editor here. We're going to do this centrally or, or I have to ask you to leave. Exactly. I'm sorry. I think I the think question is <clears throat> to reflect on the New Zealand model that is really radically yeah. opposite to the Nordic model, decriminalizing everything, and it mm -hmm. has positive effects, you claim. So, um, thank you for the question about New Zealand. Um, I think I'm one of uh, 25 people who has read that entire government report from New Zealand about prostitution in New Zealand, and it does not say what you're saying. First of all, New Zealand is a variant of legalized prostitution. Just like Amsterdam, prostitution is not zoned into the areas where the city fathers live. It is zoned into the areas where poor people and recent immigrants live, just like San Francisco and every place else in the world. So that's number one. Two, prostitution in New Zealand is profoundly racist. It's been described as an apartheid system with Maori and other women of color at the bottom rungs of prostitution and white Pakeha women uh, in different classes of prostitution, generally speaking. The report of the government of New Zealand also states that Following the implementation of the 2003 law in New Zealand, the control and abusive behavior of managers, that is, in my words, pimps, who run most of where prostitution is legal in New Zealand, which is in, in uh, brothels inside, um, those behaviors didn't change. The pimps were just as abusive as before. What did change, speaking of Me Too, is the level of harassment of all women on the street in New Zealand. There's been all kinds of complaints about this. There's been complaints about brothels setting up shop in buildings adjacent to nursery schools, toddlers, and, and um, people who take their kids to schools don't like sex buyers coming up and down the stairs of the same place where their kids are. So there are many problems with that New Zealand model, which was passed incidentally by one vote. Not, it was a brutal struggle. And sometime if you're do, if you're, I don't know if, if you're doing research on this model and you really want to hear about it, I'll tell you about my discussion two days before the vote was passed, where the guy who changed his vote uh, had some contacts with some high-ranking officials. He was originally going to vote against it. And because his vote swung, the law passed. So it's hardcore politics in New Zealand that is played out on the bodies of, of women that are marginalized and vulnerable. And I'm hearing from survivors in New Zealand, they need housing very badly. Housing is extremely expensive in New Zealand. Uh, there's a woman here, she's been asking, sorry, if oh, she could she... ask a question for a long time now here, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you give me your opinion on what key factors are necessary to make sex work and women empowered uh, work. What would make sex work a nice job? A women empowered job. To women. I don't think it's possible. I lived it for nine years, so why shouldn't it be possible? I believe that's... 
I'm sorry, Miss. Yeah, we're not, we're not going it. to do it like this. This is my last warning. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I've been asking I a few times I believe that's now. your experience. I accept it as your experience. Thank you. But what's your opinion on are there key factors in your opinion that make uh, sex work uh, pro women and what? not harming women, but uh, giving in them enlightenment and giving them strength and just being a sex worker and having a job. If I could, if I could provide answers to that question, if I thought that it was possible to make prostitution an institution without rape, with with physical safety, with equal power with men who buy sex, and with real alternatives. In other words, you, when you're looking at the option of prostitution, have an option of also becoming a journalist or a psychologist. Oh. <laughs> I have, I could be employed other ways, but I like to be a sex worker. I'm a specialized sex worker. And I would like uh, further, if you would, uh, I would like to discuss this further on private, if you want. Because you sure. say it's not impossible, and I really, I'm very serious when I say I lived it for nine years, and clients do uh, are very um, uh, respectful for my feminine uh, powers and, and uh, all the things you say. I believe that there are people in prostitution who experience it, but that's not my story. I I understand that, and I would say that. There are women like yourself who have that experience, and that is the f small percentage of women. It's also my experience in uh, going to many different countries and listening to reports of research in many different countries that most of those in prostitution have not had your experience. No, that's but are you... I understand that, and that's why I, I say I perhaps there could be a dialogue because I have key factors which I could tell you, which could uh, uh, emancipate uh, the, the branch. Well, tell what yeah. are they? Do you've well, no pimps, uh, uh, being really free to choice, not too many clients, uh, intakes. I ask for passport numbers. First of all, I go to clients, uh, they have SOA screening, all those kind of things. That's for me, it's normal. SOA screening, passport numbers. You decide how many clients you're seeing, no pimps. I agree that men who buy sex do everything they can to conceal their identities and that women who are, are being purchased by these types of guys need to find IDs and credit cards and passport numbers and phone numbers. I, I think there are so many attempts that almost every woman I know in prostitution has made to try and be safer. I wish it worked. I wish it worked. I'm, and again, it this really, isn't... I understand, but it truly really works for me because they do it voluntarily. And, when, when women... And it's not, not only sex, but it's intimacy, and it's also musicals, and uh, I also have uh, agreements, written papers, so uh, I'm really... Uh, I can say I can be safe and also if I send somebody through my company she's also safe because I first did the whole, uh, I checked the whole area, I checked the background, sometimes I'm speaking to parents or sometimes I'm speaking to... You have a company? Yes, and for about seven years I worked only alone and recently somebody is joining. Okay. okay, thank you. I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. There's the guy in the white i think yeah and yes, here we have on the yeah exactly the opposite sides they've been waiting for a long time is can i stay around afterwards for a while is of that course, okay of course of course and then maybe you can leave. have this dialogue or yeah. okay 
Um, so, uh, but I think when it comes to sex work, it's very important to look at the specific context. So when we do research on sex work, we need culture-specific uh, research uh, re because sex work is very much related to certain policies that are that are um, uh, um, working in a specific context, the consequence of policies, um, and a specific culture. So when it comes to the Netherlands, then we have here a culture of sexual tolerance, tolerance towards sexuality. Um, and when it comes to sex work, we make a distinction here between voluntary sex work and forced sex work. Now, you said in your lecture that there, are, there is no evidence of voluntary sex work. Um, and um, uh, so I would like to help it's you here out. Um, an example of, of scientific evidence of voluntary sex work is that we did, um, so I work at the University of Amsterdam, at the sociology department, we did a research among students and it turns out that 13% of, the, of a sample that we took of 446 students has been working in the sex industry. 3% uh, of these uh, students are still working in the sex industry. So we talk here about highly educated students who do have many other alternatives on the labor market and who are making voluntary choices to work in the sex industry. So it's not a matter of surviving, it's making choices. And if we really want to do scientific research on sex work, we have to include these voices in the debate. We have to include these realities in the debate. So it's cultural specific, and she says here in Holland we do have evidence of young women, high, highly educated, choosing this profession out of free will. Why are you not acknowledging the fact that they too exist? I am aware uh, in many locations, including the United States, of increasing numbers of students engaged in prostitution to pay for their education in uh, economies that are getting more difficult. What I would say is, did you ask those students if they could receive an education at the s expense of the state of the Netherlands, would they still be engaged in prostitution? So, so here comes the, in, now it's yeah. getting interesting. The <clears throat> problem here is the stigma, stigma attached to sex work. Um, if we, in, we interviewed the students, we did a survey, we did focus group discussions, or so really in-depth scientific research. And all these students were saying, our main problem is not so much the work, but it's the enormous stigma attached to the work, which makes our, our, our life difficult. So I would say if we really want to improve position of sex workers, as you, as, you, as you just said that you are concerned about sex workers, we have to get rid first of the stigma attached to the work. I'm stigma, the stigma. Oh, sorry, sorry, oh. miss. <laughs> you, can, you can discuss that later. We can all go to the bar and we can discuss yeah. that later, but not now. Good idea. Yeah. The stigma, can you respond uh, to the problem of the stigma? Oh, it's for, for these women, <laughs> the bigger problem is the stigma, not the client. Um, I, I mean, I think I've said, I don't think there should be a stigma. However, um, I, I think the issue is options. I, I don't see people choosing prostitution if they have real viable alternatives, if they have housing, jobs, I, I, I just don't see that. And but if the income... That they are existing. Yeah. It's 13% it's of 440. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not okay, that, this, the, I'm not saying this is true of 100% of people in prostitution. Obviously, we have somebody here who chooses it. However, if you fail to recognize the driving force of prostit of uh, if if you fail to recognize the driving force of racism, poverty, and sexism, the three bars on the cage, you're ignoring a whole lot of women in the world. But is that maybe a, a very uh, big difference between the approach of pro and anti activists? The focus that you focus specifically on, in your opinion, the big room group of unvoluntary working women, victims of human trafficking, yeah. and that often the other side is focusing on the empowered uh, feminist women, high educated, choosing, choosing And more this racially life. privileged, usually. So it's a, it's a matter of focus, maybe. 
I don't think so, but... <laughs> oh, well, that's what I'm hearing here. It's a different... I want to go to this gentleman, uh, because yeah, he's maybe. been so patient without yelling. Much appreciated. <laughs> Yeah, there we go again. Oh, well, thank you for the compliment. I try to be patient. <laughs> um, quite coincidentally, this lady here just mentioned one of the things I wanted to mention. Oh, well, there help is, her out. There is a growing phenomenon in America and in Europe now of agencies where primarily uh, young student females uh, and uh, elderly uh, businessmen, um, uh, single men, they meet each other through these agencies and they exchange sexual services for money. The females often pay their, their college bills and, and also um, uh, housewives. And it's a satisfactory arrangement. And many of the girls who do it originally to pay their uh, college bills, they stay in the industry after uh, 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 graduation because they enjoy the lifestyle, the freedom it offers, the money it offers, and they choose for it. It's a growing phenomenon in America and also in Britain now. So I, I hear only from your point of view the, 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 the horrible uh, stories about how despicable people can be to uh, lesser well-off people, and we should all condemn that enormously. But you don't seem to take any account at all that they are assigned some uh, areas or incidents where the, uh, f the mature interaction between two people consensually with no risk that that can have some positive value. And you seem to yeah, give them no credit at all for their own self-autonomy, just kicking. And the last point, I don't want to be too long, what I hear from a lot of my female friends in Amsterdam, who are 35, 40, 45, they're vehemently anti-prostitution because they say, yes, well, sex should be in a relationship, and in a relationship there's commitment and there's commitment, and people come home and they talk and they look after the kids, and they but when they can just go down the red light and get what they want, then they don't come home anymore. So they're, they're undercutting, my, they're, they're, they're devaluing my value as a woman. So they feel that their capital on the market, on the, wow. on the, on the mating market, is devalued by prostitution. And that makes them vehemently anti-prostitution. Now you're so I think, I think, so the, I think that's no. very unfair. <laughs> I think it's very unfair, but, but you, are you now, fair is anyone else want to is answer? Don't give in. If, there are is the points. question if Miss Farley maybe is jealous or I uh, don't the, get the, what the, the primary question, is. question was why is she so and, and you did it yourself after this young lady's question, why is she so furiously um, uh, zoomed in on the awful underbelly of the society, which is which we all know about. It happens in the diamond industry in West Africa. Their women are slaved and beaten yeah. and, so, and they have to pick okay. diamonds. You're but why don't you talk about okay. them? You're describing a profoundly unequal relationship between men who have money and women who do not, but, oh, yeah. be, but yeah, between yeah. men who um, have resources that women don't have, and it is a form of prostitution. The dating websites, sugar daddy websites, um, the pimps are always coming up with new words for it. And so uh, I don't see it, what you're describing, as particularly different from any other form of prostitution. We simply can't keep up with the new tech iterations of it, whether it's webcamming that someone mentioned or anything else. I, re I really reject your statement blaming jealous girlfriends and wives pointing <laughs> fingers at, at other women. Uh, I, I don't agree with that at all. No. Right well, no. Oh, sorry. Well, I think, I think that was something. a very clear answer, actually, and I think we are repeating. That's what I meant with the focus. I, oh. I, you tend to focus on, in your well, opinion, well, the underbelly, in your opinion, 95% of the pyramid. To just keep repeating that is, I think, improductive. I want to thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, I hope the two of you will meet afterwards to see if you can arrange the dialogue. I want to thank you very much for being here and Renate van der Zee for arranging this. Um, you. And Yuri de Bali, thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for your moderation. Oh, Amazing. <laughs> Difficult job.